Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, MLF uh, OPERI webinar. Uh, my name is John Armour. I am the academic director of the MLF program, and I'm joined here by my colleague uh, Dan Ori uh, and two of our current uh, MLF students, Kira Duima uh, and um, Corey Metzman, uh, and then uh, two members of the uh, MLF admin team, uh, Victoria Campbell and uh, Nicola Key. Uh, so we're delighted that so many of you are able to be with us this afternoon. So I understand there's about 30 uh, people uh, joining us live. Uh, and of course, if you're not here live, you'll be able to uh, hear this recorded uh, at a subsequent point. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to talk through a brief overview of the MSc in Law and Finance program. Then Dan's going to talk uh, more specifically about the Law and Economics of Corporate Transactions course. Uh, then we're going to have a, a short discussion with our two current students uh, and then we'll be throwing things open to uh, questions that we're receiving from you. So we are keeping a note of the questions that you're sending in. If a question occurs to you while one of us is talking, uh, just fire it off. Uh, and then the second half of the session, uh, Nicola will be um, relaying those questions to us. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, let's go on now to look at the slide uh, which has on it the course structure. Uh, so uh, we should now have up uh, the slide which has a, a picture of the course structure. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk through uh, what the uh, MLF uh, course uh, covers. So the MLF is intended to be um, a, a, a mixture of uh, practical, uh, uh, practically informed courses, um, but with, with an academic um, leadership provided. Uh, and what we're giving students is an analytic toolkit uh, that allows them to uh, take uh, their prior legal background uh, and transform that to something that's useful uh, when working either with uh, financial sector clients uh, or in the transactional context or indeed to make a move out of law altogether into uh, uh, other sectors like regulatory uh, or uh, finance uh, itself. Uh, so the course structure in Oxford we have three terms. Um, and the way the course is designed is we assume that most people coming in have a background in law, um, but not so much of a background in finance. And so the course is uh, front loads the finance material. So we begin uh, with a pre-sessional uh, course in mathematics uh, and a pre-sessional course in financial reporting, which are intended to bring people up to speed uh, with basic material that they will then draw upon uh, later in the course. We then go into, uh, in the first term, which we call Michaelmas, uh, the finance course, which will run uh, over Michaelmas and Hillary, that's the second term. Uh, you can see that at the top of the, uh, of the, of the slide. Uh, and then we also start a course called First Principles of Financial Economics. So these two courses provide the necessary tools in finance and economics, uh, which you'll be then using later in the year uh, to uh, analyze uh, legal uh, topics. We also, uh, at the beginning of the year, students will start um, their elective courses. Uh, now, what we have done up to this point is to give people a choice of two law electives, uh, and these run throughout the year. The most popular courses uh, have typically been the Law of Corporate Finance and Principles of Financial Regulation, and these two courses um, provide students with a grounding in the substantive law uh, uh, raise, relating to the raising of finance by corporations and the uh, principles guiding the regulation of financial institutions, uh, respectively. However, from next year, uh, we hope, uh, and this is, I think, pretty much um, uh, confirmed, that we will be able to offer students the choice, instead of one of those law electives, to do uh, what we're going to call a finance track, uh, which is to do two further finance courses. So this will be for students who want to increase the component of finance in the MLF uh, degree that they take. And students doing that will do one law elective, uh, and then in the Hillary term, we'll start a course called Corporate Valuation. Uh, and in the Trinity term, the third term, we'll do an uh, additional finance elective. Uh, and that will include courses like entrepreneurship, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and uh, investment banking case studies. Uh, so there'll be a range of additional uh, finance courses for people who want to uh, pursue that. Throughout the year, we also have a series of uh, law and finance events. We have law and finance uh, senior practitioner lectures, uh, academic seminars, and workshops going on, which are not linked to particular courses, but which students can attend uh, in order to enhance the 
uh, 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 utility that they get from the program as a whole. Now, what we've uh, what I've described so far has been uh, the uh, the finance courses and the electives um, that the the whole of the program comes together uh, around a core course um, called Law and Economics of Corporate Transactions. And this runs uh, during the uh, second uh, part of the year, so it starts after Christmas, uh, and students do a theoretical component uh, during the Hillary term, and then in the Trinity term they move on to a practical component. And this practical exercise is intended to bring together both the law and the finance. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, my colleague Dan Ori, who teaches the course, and he's going to say a little bit more about how the core course uh, brings together the different components of the program. Thank you, John. The, uh, the course Law and Economics of Corporate Transactions is a unique uh, bespoke course created for the MLF uh, that is only for uh, the MLF students uh, in each year's class. And as John says, it's really where theory meets practice, and it's also uh, where the law meets finance and economics, bringing everything together uh, under one umbrella for the purpose of the course. It takes uh, the theoretical microeconomic tools from first principles of financial economics. It takes the finance insights from the finance course and then situates students in the context of corporate transactions, questions about institutional design, uh, and then asks them, uh, in effect, what is the lawyer's role in all of this? Uh, and the answer, uh, as uh, uh, put across in the course, is really one of understanding economic problems that arise in the, in the context of corporate transactions and how lawyers uh, and transaction structures uh, can add value uh, through the judicious selection of different types of legal, contractual, uh, and institutional uh, arrangements. Uh, the structure of the course is designed to take us from uh, a general uh, theoretical uh, uh, level to one that progressively deals with more complex real-world problems. Uh, at the theoretical level, we explore uh, four uh, primary problems uh, in the course, information problems, agency problems, uh, hold-up problems in strategic behavior, uh, and something uh, that we call futurity, which is really what happens when we start contracting over time and in conditions of uncertainty. This uh, theoretical portion of the course takes place during Hillary term, so the middle term uh, after Christmas. Uh, and in connection with that, we also uh, start using uh, our understanding of these economic problems to understand both how we find them in everyday examples in the real world, whether it be uh, in the context of buying a used car or purchasing shares in Facebook, uh, towards more complex uh, legal and transactional structures, uh, whether it be uh, securitization, uh, private equity, uh, or any number of uh, the other type of uh, structures that we see uh, in the corporate world. This is then augmented at the end of Hillary term uh, with three uh, more sui generis sessions, uh, one uh, on the law and economics of law firms, uh, always one of the most popular uh, sessions. It's always nice to uh, turn our new analytical toolkit on ourselves and see how it is uh, the various economic problems uh, we explore in this course and in the program as a whole actually affect uh, how we behave as lawyers, how we organize ourselves in firms, uh, and other ways uh, that we can bring these tools uh, to gain insight into uh, the operation of our own uh, little part of the world. We also have a session on tax. Uh, as many of you will know, it's very difficult to understand uh, much in the way of corporate structuring without having a basic understanding of the tax system, the characterization uh, of different types of income, uh, capital, uh, and whatnot. Lastly, we have a session on transactional ethics. Uh, one of the things uh, that will become apparent uh, in the course of taking uh, the course and the program as a whole is that the knowledge and skills that you're gaining uh, can often be used uh, for things like regulatory arbitrage. And so we thought that it was a good idea to have a session where we threw open uh, uh, the bigger picture question of the lawyer's role in society uh, given potential arbitrage opportunities at the nexus of uh, law and finance. This then uh, completes Hillary term. We change gears significantly uh, in Trinity term. So we've done the theory, we've done some uh, preset problems uh, that enable us to exercise uh, our growing intellectual muscle in the area of law and economics. And in Trinity term, uh, we test that against real-world deals involving uh, the real-world protagonists on those deals. So the lawyers, uh, often uh, their uh, internal counsel uh, and clients. 
Uh, and what we ask students to do is then take the skills they've learned in Hillary term and then use them to reverse engineer transactions that we've provided them. So what students will effectively get is a, a complete deal with a, uh, the full suite or certainly a large portion of the original deal documentation. They'll then be asked to work in groups uh, to review this documentation, review what publicly inf available information they can find on the transactions, and then tell us and tell the practitioners what they thought were the most important and interesting aspects of these transactions. Uh, this is ultimately uh, the part of the course uh, that students uh, find most rewarding and most worthwhile to test, uh, if you will, the theoretical intuitions against how things work in practice. Uh, and of course, uh, theory and practice don't always play well together, and that ultimately is one of the lessons uh, that comes from uh, this course and the program as a whole, and provides us with a tool then to understand how those mismatches uh, potentially impact on transacting uh, and on the role of finance uh, in society. The last thing uh, in the course, uh, we pit all of these groups uh, against one another uh, in evaluation exercise. Uh, this year's transaction, for example, will be a loan-to-own deal uh, involving a uh, distressed debt uh, a hedge fund uh, and its purchase of a, a global fitness brand. Students will be asked to uh, value the deal, bringing in their corporate finance uh, experience. They'll also be asked to look at uh, contractual documentation uh, and various legislative provisions in the different jurisdictions in which, in which this business operates and ask what sort of legal risks uh, might be residing beneath the surface of this deal and as a strategic matter, how can we go about mitigating them on behalf of our clients. Ultimately, uh, as I said at the outset, the goal of this is to help uh, us understand how economics and finance can help inform uh, our role as lawyers, but as well, uh, it's broader sort of uh, objective is to then help people understand how this theoretical toolkit can be used by lawyers in practice, by finance professionals structuring transactions, uh, and by policymakers looking to understand the ways in which the law affects the way that market participants uh, and institutional arrangements work in practice. John. So uh, thanks very much for that, Dan. We're now going to um, hand over to uh, Victoria, who's going to uh, chair a discussion with uh, two of our uh, current uh, MLS students. So Great. Um, uh, over, over to you guys. Thanks, John. Um, just to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, please do um, submit them via the chat window, and we will get around to answering those in a moment. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you, two of our current students, Kira and Corey. Um, they kindly agreed to share um, some of their insights into the programme with us. Um, Kira is from Finland and um, prior to the MLS she worked in private practice at a law firm in Helsinki and Corey comes from the USA and prior to the MLS is engaged in academic study including economics and international development studies. So Kira, if I can start with you, um, what motivated you to want to study the MLS? Um, well, I had for a long time in mind that I, I knew that I wanted to do in some, some sort of postgraduate studies. Uh, either. I was kind of uh, considering between an pure LLM or then an MBA degree, um, and I didn't know about the MLS when I, uh, before I actually started doing my research for the kind of next next year studies. And when I w found out about the, the Oxford MLS program, I, I knew instantly that this is exactly what I want to do, and I've been really happy with the kind of ability to um, take advantage of both both of those degrees. Excellent. And Corey, how about you? Why did you want to do the MLS in Oxford? I think uh, it was for a few reasons. First was when I was an undergraduate, I was lucky to take a very introductory class in law and economics, and the way of thinking that it introduced me to I found very interesting. So I knew that I wanted to continue that. And I was also very fortunate during a few of my summers to pursue professional internships, both in the government in the United States and in the private financial sector that allowed me to gain more practical experience to this. Um, and so the MLF um, was unique in that it provided me an opportunity and is providing me an opportunity to get a very deep exposure to these issues um, and one that comes both through the functional lens of law as well as through the lens of finance and then in a very complementary way. And then to answer the second part of the question about why Oxford, I think a few things come to mind. I think first is relative um, to a lot of other universities, the collegiate system is very, very unique and I think that's fantastic. So um, we have a social home. Um, or very much a part of something called the MCR or the Middle Common Room, which um, at each college, which both refers to 
um, the governance organization for postgraduate students in the college, as well as the physical space where we can gather. And then I think um, there are other aspects about Oxford which are wonderful, such as, uh, at least relative to the United States, there's a much more inclusive attitude towards sport. So for instance, I was able to row in Michaelmas, um, and I recently picked up squash as well. Um, and I think all of these activities, um, that's a long way of saying, have just been a very nice complement to the academic study in a way that I'm not sure that I'd be able to find elsewhere. Right. Um, and in terms of the program, what have you found the most interesting about it so far? Um, I'd say two things. I think first is the incredible diversity of the students in the MLF. So we were talking for a few moments before we went live, and in our class there are about 46 students from 27 or 28 different countries. And um, as you mentioned, I pursued a course of study as an undergraduate in international studies, and I thought that was diverse, but I had no idea what diversity was until I came here. And so I think that, first of all, has been amazing. And the second thing is the tutorial system at Oxford is a very unique system of pedagogy in which the exchange and the depth of conversation that you have with a tutor or with a professor um, is something that I never experienced before and has been unparalleled in that regard. And I think that goes along with a very specific type of essay writing, um, an argumentative type of analysis that you're asked to express an opinion and defend it, and you're pushed harder than um, you might be pushed otherwise to defend it, which I think makes you a better advocate and a better thinker as well. Great. And Kira, what about the most challenging thing for you about the program? Well, um, I think personally, probably the jump becoming back, being a student again was maybe a, not a shock, but some, something like quite challenging in the beginning of the year. Um, but I'm, I'm fully enjoying it, so it's, it's been a great year here. Um, and in terms of the, the kind of more like study related, I think just getting used to the uh, Oxford style of studying, I mean, a lot of essay writing, um, really different from my previous studies in Finland. Um, but again, it's been really rewarding kind of to get to know how, how, the, how, how an essay, Oxford style of essay is, is written. And, and, um, and I also enjoyed, uh, enjoyed a lot of that, the tutorial system that we have, have here. So Excellent. And what are you planning to do after the MLF? Um, I th I'm planning to go back to my law firm, I, uh, but because uh, I attended this program, uh, I was given an opportunity to move to our London office. So um, I will be going back to private practice, uh, but in another jurisdiction. Excellent. Um, and Corey, in what ways do you think the MLF will help you to achieve your long-term career goals? Um, so I think the first and most obvious way is the substantive knowledge that that it offers us as students in law and finance. In particular, I'm very interested in financial policy and financial regulation. Um, and uh, there's not another program I could have applied to, certainly not in the United States or even here in the UK that I was looking at that would have given me this unique combination um, with really both the, f the focus on law and the focus on finance. And perhaps a complementary aspect that I think will be very helpful is there's, there's a way of analytical thinking and the ability to learn general principles and learn where the borders of those principles are when they apply to specific circumstances, which I think is useful more broadly both in law and in business, both in finance and in non-financial sectors of business as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and finally, so as you know, everyone watching will, will have an offer for the MLF and they're currently, a lot of them are currently deciding whether or not to accept. Um, so for those people that are deciding and for those people that have already accepted, um, do you have any top tips for people who, who will be starting the course? Uh, in September? Um, yeah, I would say um, whether or not yeah. program or coming up to Oxford or anything uh, that might be useful. I, I haven't regretted a single minute of taking the offer and coming here. Um, I was a bit concerned in the beginning whether I have my, whether my basically non-existent financial background uh, or at least academic financial background would um, would uh, be a problem but it hasn't been so no need to worry about maths or or finance they're really good support for that in the beginning of the year um, and uh, Oxford is a great city um, a great place to live uh, it's really inspiring to be here you're surrounded by by great students and great professors all the time and you get great support for if, if there's any problems throughout the year so I'm I'm really happy with the choice here. Great. Uh, you mentioned you were from a uh, more of a non-financial background. Did you find you had the right level of maths, or um, was, it, was it easy to kind of um, follow the classes at the beginning? And it was uh, it was quite easy, but I did definitely find it extremely useful to have that um, the the kind of finance support class in the beginning and and the, the financial reporting class that we had just before the term started. 
Um, so they kind of got me up to speed with that that part of the the that finance financial part of the course. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, yeah, I didn't find it too difficult. Um, but it was really still kind of a useful, very useful thing to have in the beginning of the year. Yeah. And Corey, any any final top tips? Um, I'd say one is. Um, don't underestimate the value of a library system here, actually. <laughs> um, not only is it incredibly well-resourced, but I've never studied in more beautiful places. Um, a lot of the collegiate libraries as well as the faculty libraries are just fantastic in that respect. And I would just really second and underscore what Kira said about Oxford as a city in terms of arts and culture and sports and other opportunities um, that are available here as well. Excellent. Well, thank you both very much. And now I'm going to hand it to Nicola. Thank you very much. We've had a few questions that have been coming in um, since we've been online, and obviously, um, please do type in some more. Um, the, actually, I think we've had an answer to this one, which is, is it necessary to have a preliminary knowledge of accounting before I start the course? Um, and I think Kira has yeah. already answered that one, um, that there's a lot of... Uh, pre-sessional support that uh, that takes place. I don't know if you have anything else yeah, to add to that. Could I just say um, a word or two about uh, maths and uh, accounting. So um, we make no assumptions about people's uh, mathematical background. Um, so every year um, uh, some part of our student body uh, will not have studied maths since they were 16. Uh, and in some cases that's, that's quite a long time. Um, and we are we design the program so that people uh, who are in that position are nevertheless able to flourish within the context of the degree. Um, so uh, people are sent a maths workbook, um, which is a self-study pack uh, that's ta tailored to the needs of the program, which uh, they are able to work through over the summer. And if you are uh, if your maths background, um, if it's been a while since you've uh, done anything mathematical, it is very important that you set aside some time to work through that because it will make it much easier for you when you arrive. Uh, when you do arrive, we have um, an intensive um, math maths course uh, which gives people uh, uh, an overview of the necessary quantitative skills, and those two things together are designed to bring people up to speed. The technical level of competence required is really not very high. Uh, we're talking about uh, typically uh, skills that people will have studied in school um, up to age 16. Um, but the, the challenge for some people is that it's a long time since they've looked at those, and so really it's, it's more a matter of uh, refreshing people's minds. Um, for people who are still struggling, um, uh, a minority of students who are still struggling with the quantitative aspect as the uh, substantive finance courses start, uh, we offer tailored math support classes uh, to uh, help them uh, to uh, uh, gain confidence as the course <coughs> progresses. Uh, and Kira, I think you were one of the students who um, had not studied math since 16. Yeah. Uh, and did you, you found the uh, you found the support to be um, adequate? Definitely. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I found the pre-sessional course uh, support classes very useful. I also attended a lot of the support classes throughout the middle of the year, uh, term, um, and it was really help. It was really helpful. Uh, but I never had that kind of doubt that um, that I would not be that my, my skills will not be good enough for the for the exam, for example. Um, and definitely finance two course that we just finished. Uh, it goes more into kind of financial theories. And again, I think lawyers, those who, we, who have a law background actually might be even better positioned in some terms because there's a lot of um, also essay writing and theoretical questions. And so not that quantitative, you don't need to have that strong quantitative skills to kind of master that course very well. Great. 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 Um, uh, a couple of questions here which uh, perhaps speak to the same thing. Um, uh, how's the interaction between professors and students during classes? But also, please, uh, a further explanation about the tutorial system and how that works in the context of the MLS and is it um, used for law or finance subjects or both? So, how does a tutorial work? So, um, Back to John, I think. Yeah. The the, the way the pedagogy is structured, um, there, are, there is a diversity uh, of different uh, pedagogical uh, formats that we use uh, for different parts of the course. Uh, so the finance courses are delivered primarily through interactive 
uh, lecture sessions um, and they're followed up with uh, smaller group uh, support classes. Uh, the law electives are delivered through a combination of lectures, uh, seminar classes and tutorials. So the tutorials principally are focused on the uh, law electives, uh, but all the sessions whether they be lectures, seminars, support classes, or tutorials, are intended to be interactive uh, and to give students opportunities to ask questions. The degree to which students are expected to articulate their own views is what differentiates the different formats. So lectures, the talking is primarily done by the lecturer, um, whereas in seminars, the expectation is that the students will do uh, the majority of the talking. Um, Cora, do you, do you want to uh, add to that? Uh, well, so. I think that is a very accurate description, in fact, how you described the difference between lectures and seminars in one of the modules that, I, that I'm taking with you currently. I think um, the difference is, to put it concretely, in a lecture, for instance, in some of the finance lectures or one of the lectures that may be delivered as part of a law elective, um, the depth of questions may be only one question deep, but then you will expose, um, or you go several layers deep um, when you're in a seminar and even deeper in a tutorial, and not only will you go deep, but you're also moving laterally at those deep layers as well, considering whatever question is particularly salient that day from multiple perspectives, um, and frequently not coming to a conclusive answer, not because of lack of evidence or because of lack of argumentation on each side, but rather because the quality of the discussion is so deep and so rich. And so I think that's probably the, um, the main difference as well. Great. Um, uh, uh, perhaps a uh, uh, relating to the same subject again, just a question here about the typical class size um, for each for, for the different uh, um, sessions that you run. Um, Dan? Dan? Sure. Uh, for all of the courses that are tailored to MLF students, the MLF class as a whole takes them on their own. So uh, the cohort of 46 this year, for example, will have taken as a group of 46, the lectures in first principles of financial economics, uh, in finance, uh, and in LECT. Uh, for the law electives, uh, the class size varies depending on the nature of the class, as does, uh, in relation to John's answer to the previous question, the type of pedag pedagogical uh, uh, environment that people work in. So for uh, Principles of Financial Regulation, for example, which is a course that uh, both John and I teach on and is one of the more popular electives, uh, our class size uh, is uh, uh, roughly the same, if not slightly larger, so in the range of about 50 uh, students. Uh, and then there are a series of tutorials in connection with that where uh, three to five students uh, at a time uh, meet and discuss, uh, as Corey uh, probably explained better than any student who, who's ever sat in that chair, uh, uh, what goes on uh, there. Uh, different courses, though, may be considerably smaller. I would say that uh, Principles of Financial Regulation is one of the larger courses in that regard. Uh, and then, as well, we have to uh, take into account uh, the finance stream starting next year as well, uh, where the corporate valuation and other finance electives are uh, typically smaller, I believe, than uh, something like Principles of Financial Regulation. Great. Uh, just um, questions from um, earlier on in the session. Um, we have uh, someone here asking about uh, the career options other than law that then this course might uh, help them to look at. Does it broaden the palette um, into different areas, for example, the financial market? Um, you have to take that? Yeah, Dan, perhaps you speak to that one. Uh, and I should say uh, at the outset as well that uh, prior to becoming an academic, I was a lawyer in private practice, and then uh, I worked as uh, a mergers and acquisitions director for uh, an investment fund, uh, which are two of the careers uh, that uh, are possible as a result of having the skill set uh, and the perspective that you gain on the MLF. Uh, so the first thing to say is that uh, many uh, of our students uh, are either uh, coming from private practice and certainly go back into private practice in law firms. And we really do uh, believe that our students uh, have uh, consistently given us feedback on this, that the MLF is a career accelerator in that regard because of the finance skills and the bringing together of law and finance. That same skill set, though, uh, can be very uh, useful in other contexts, ones where we've uh, received quite good feedback, both from students 
uh, and employers uh, is in the area of public policy. Uh, we're taking an un, a, a deep understanding of the law and legislative processes and being able to take a norm, more normative view on how the law affects the behavior uh, of those that are subject to it uh, and how we might better design those laws uh, is something uh, that uh, is really quite useful. And we've had a number of our uh, uh, former students uh, go into uh, public policy work, both at the domestic and international level. We also see a high, uh, uh, some really uh, high levels, of, I'm going to use a terrible word here, synergies uh, with uh, investment fund and M&A work, where increasingly uh, the world of finance is becoming about the rules of the game. And here, in addition to having finance skills, that legal background and having uh, some sort of sense of the regulatory parameters within which finance takes place is increasingly important. And we can see this whether it be uh, going to work for a private equity fund or a hedge fund and having to understand the regulatory environment, uh, applicable insolvency laws, for example, all the way up to going to work uh, as uh, either an investment banker or in-house counsel for a bank where you've got to understand the plethora of rules and regulations that apply to the conduct of these institutions. In either of those cases, uh, we really see that the MLF uh, is paying dividends uh, for our students, uh, and it's great to see that they're starting to come back and tell us about their experiences having done this for a few years, uh, and how uh, the skills uh, and theoretical frameworks that we introduced them to or helped them augment uh, have paid dividends uh, for them. Uh, lastly, we've had some uh, really sort of interesting, uh, completely unexpected uh, uh, careers uh, launched as a result of the MLF. So we have two or three students who are currently uh, engaged in entrepreneurship within the legal technology sector. Uh, so understanding how the law as a discipline is changing uh, and attempting uh, to launch businesses that take advantages of those changes, specifically uh, in relation to how lawyers market themselves how they go about the task of uh, uh, what traditionally would have been considered uh, uh, more day-to-day -day drafting uh, of corporate documents, but which itself, though may seem mundane, can actually become incredibly complex and in how technology can help us in that regard. Uh, and so we've really been quite excited by some of the things that we never could have predicted uh, that our students have gone off uh, and started to do career-wise. Thank you, Dan. Um, in fact, you, you've answered a question here that, that came in about uh, using this knowledge uh, in regulatory public policy, particularly in developing countries such as India. You commented about uh, commented that, so thank you very much. Um, but there's more questions here about internship opportunities offered um, for the MLF course and um, uh, the career support provided for the MLF students. And related to that, um, a couple of uh, specific questions about uh, applying for law firm um, vacation schemes and um, any other internships that are on offer. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to comment on that. I can I can comment on some things, but obviously the internships are, are of interest, um, particularly actually the Oxford University internship program, which is aside from law, but there are there are a lot of um, um, uh, uh, internships specifically on offer for general Oxford University students which are unrelated to this program but might be some of interest to some some students to, as a broader horizon but anyway to the to the law internships you might want to say something John yeah so um, we don't have a structured internship um, program that's linked specifically to this uh, to this course um, but what we do uh, have is a very well set up um, careers support for people who uh, want to do uh, internships uh, through law firms' own programs. And most law firms run uh, and financial institutions run internships um, which students are able to apply for um, uh, during the vacations while they're here. Um, in terms of careers support, uh, we have a mixture of different sources of career support. So. Um, the business school has a careers team, the university as a whole has a very large and well-resourced careers service, and then within the MLF itself we have um, uh, one of our uh, personnel whose role is to help the uh, MLF students with their own particular uh, career trajectories, um, and that's, that's Nicola, and, and I'll ask Nicola to say a word or two uh, in a moment about um, the, the ways in which she's helping 
our current students. Um, but just to uh, explain what the uh, rationale for that structure is, um, that many students uh, in our, uh, our other programs, particularly our undergraduate students, um, have a fairly well-defined career trajectory ahead of them. Most of them, uh, or a large proportion of them, want to go and work in law firms. Uh, and law firms actually market themselves very effectively uh, to Oxford students. They're very keen to recruit Oxford students, and they do quite a lot to raise Oxford students' awareness of the opportunities in their firms and to indeed to recruit our students. Um, but that's targeted at the uh, entry level, so for people who want training contracts. Now, the difference with the MLS students is that many, uh, many MLS students, and many of you watching this now, already have prior uh, professional experience. And so it's a much more bespoke exercise thinking about people's career uh, trajectories because people are wanting to use a combination of their prior experience plus the skills that they've acquired on the MLF to then uh, make the next step. Uh, and what, what, the, uh, what we try to do is to maintain um, a range of contacts with employer organizations um, to whom we uh, make clear the value that the MLF program brings and we also send information about our current cohort of students. So for example at the beginning of each year we produce a profile book which we send out to employers and we make available uh, detailing the skills and experience of our current students and their career ambitions. Um, so we try, to, we try to send that information out to potential employers but we also um, give students uh, insight into which employers might be uh, ones that would particularly value their unique skill sets. And so what we're trying to do essentially is to offer a more uh, tailored service. Uh, now we can't uh, obviously guarantee uh, that pe people will, uh, you know, that, that we'll find people a job, um, but the stats in terms of uh, career placements are very positive. Uh, so in excess of 90% I think of the uh, students who uh, wanted uh, further employment or wanted employment when they left the MLF program were in fact uh, in employment within uh, three months of uh, graduation and you can see uh, on the website there's a document called the uh, MLF employment report which contains details of, uh, uh, of, of prior, um, uh, prior cohorts. So Nicola can I turn it over to you and, and just ask you to say a word or two about um, what you're doing with our current students. Uh, yes, hello. Um, so I'm I've, I've, um, running a, a fairly open door policy for students who uh, want to come talk to me about their um, strategy, um, specifically look at their CVs, have some interview uh, discussion or interview practice. Um, I'm also um, uh, facilitating uh, information to come to you um, so that uh, you see jobs which are um, available, um, I'm, I'm, I'm filtering jobs through which I think are of interest um, and use, making sure that you have um, an understanding of all the resources that you can tap into which are enormous. Um, as John's already mentioned, there are two really very productive career services full, you know, packed full of, of useful talks and useful sessions um, and so my job is really to make sure that people on the MLF actually know what they can use, what's going to be most useful to them, and also we run sessions ourselves um, right from the beginning. So before you get here, there's a great deal of information to absorb, um, which will be made available on the WebLearn page about um, presentations which are coming up right at the beginning of the year about um, steps that you need to take even before you get here so that you're really well prepared when you arrive um, with uh, all the information at your fingertips to hit the ground running and to engage with um, the pursuit of whichever job it is that you 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 feel is 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 uh, is in your target. Um, having said that, there's there's a, a couple of specific questions here about um, uh, the how does the job market compare um, the MLF to the BCL, uh, for example. Um, so obviously this is another course run from the, the postgraduate course from the law faculty um, and perhaps John can answer that in a minute. Um, just to say that throughout the year there, there are um, uh, practitioners coming to talk, there are um, uh, specialists coming to, um, to, to have sessions and um, really we do everything we can to make sure that um, you, you get to where you want to go. Um, so. Uh, everyone, everyone gets the most that they can out of the opportunities there. 
um, perhaps John, you'd like to say a few words about the, the BCL. Um. And, oh, actually, I just wondered if we might ask um, one of our, or both of our uh, current uh, students here to just comment on uh, their experience of, the, uh, of, our, of our support for um, career, uh, career moves. Sure, yeah. Uh, I think it's been amazing <laughs> to start with. Um, I was really surprised, although like I said, I kind of had my, my next steps planned already quite early, uh, of the, uh, during the already in, in the beginning of the year, um, but there has been tremendous support all throughout the year. Um, uh, we have, I'm really uh, happy with the, there are actually like two mentoring programs, one with the alumni uh, and one uh, with the law firm here, and I think that is really great support, uh, kind of shows um, the, the scope of uh, support coming from different different people, um, if it's an alum, alumnus that you want to talk to, or just to kind of get an understanding of how it's how the legal career um, in the city looks like, then there's a, a contact person in a, in a law firm. Um, and then the support here, um, I've uh, taken advantage of both the MLF-specific uh, career support, kind of refining my CV for future, future possible steps at some point, um, and then also um, attended some really, some really, really um, inspiring uh, career events here at the SBS, so the business school, um, which have kind of uh, shown me options that are not maybe really traditional for lawyers, uh, say kind of uh, social finance, impact investment work, which I find extremely interesting in the future, um, and um, I've been really happy with the support that we've been given throughout the year. There are two. There are two things that, that I would add to that. First is that, in addition to everything that's already been mentioned, there have been a few sessions that have been hosted um, by some of the career specialists here at Oxford specifically for the MLF. So for instance, the director of the career services department here at the business school, early, very early in the year, came and had a session with us, um, which he allowed us to follow up on if we wanted. The second thing that I highlight, which hasn't been mentioned at all, is actually one of the um, really cool things, in my opinion, is the, the diversity of students within the MLF means that we use each other a lot mm -hmm. and each other's past experiences, um, not only to network and connections um, within the professional space, but also to prepare for interviews. And so, um, as it's been alluded to, frequently students will come to the MLF and look to move laterally, perhaps um, into finance or into a different area of law. And given that a large proportion of the class is all, has significant work experience, there are students with whom that they can get firsthand exposure and, um, and even interview preparation that they might not otherwise have access to. Great, and I wanted to just pick up on a, a point about the uh, BCL versus the MLS. So the BCL is a, a, a very a venerable uh, graduate qualification that we've been offering uh, for longer than we've actually taught our undergraduate degree. Uh, and it has an incredibly uh, well-established record and uh, is, is an e exceedingly well-respected uh, qualification. Um, the MLF uh, is a new program, uh, we're, we're entering our fifth year, uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that it has established itself very rapidly uh, as a program that is also uh, exceedingly uh, well respected in the marketplace. So just to give you a bit of background, before uh, we set the MLF up, I went to talk to uh, a large number of um, organizations, uh, law firms, investment banks, regulators, uh, about what we were proposing to do uh, and to seek their input uh, to the uh, uh, course design. And many of the uh, individuals from uh, those organizations, uh, senior individuals, sit on our advisory board. And you can see details of the advisory board on the MLF uh, website. And we meet regularly with them uh, to get input and to provide um, them with information about our current students and where our students are going. Now, I have to say that at the beginning, at the very beginning before we set the course up, some people were uh, a little skeptical as to what the uh, value added uh, of the MLS students would be. So our, our agenda was to say, look, uh, the BCL program has this fantastic reputation. Uh, the reputation is, um, is focused on, uh, in particular, on people who want to be litigators, uh, on people who want to be academics. Um, but what we wanted to do was to have a program that would be uh, equally respected for people who want to be transactional lawyers, or who want to be regulators, or who want to be academics. And so the MLF was intended to occupy a complementary but distinct space uh, from the BCL program. And as I said, the, the reaction initially was, um, was, a, was a little skeptical as to what the need for this kind of uh, program was. That skepticism, I think, has rapidly been dispelled. So the, the, the very same people 
who sat across the table from me and expressed skepticism, uh, came back to me having recruited our students, and their question was, how do we get more of your students to come and work for us? Uh, and employers now um, who have recruited MLS students are incredibly keen uh, to get access to our current students uh, and are asking us if we can set up specific uh, MLF sessions where they can talk to the MLS students uh, and help to increase the number of MLS students that they recruit. Uh, so the, uh, the reputation of the MLF is a function of our alumni. Uh, our alumni are doing exceedingly well, they are making rapid progress and so the reputation is growing over time. Reputation is probably not, uh, it's fair to say, as broad and as deep as the BCL uh, is at present, but it is growing much more rapidly, uh, and I anticipate that the trajectory uh, will continue going forwards. The other thing to say is that the entry requirements are equal in terms of academic merit, uh, and that is also understood by employers. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, 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 the cohorts are uh, equally uh, talented in terms of their abilities. Um, and uh, perhaps, uh, well, there's another comment here of yeah. someone who's choosing between BCL and alternative uh, uh, MLF and alternative courses in other universities. I don't know if you have any comments about uh, the the NLC at Cambridge or any of the uh, MCL. Uh, okay. MCL. Sorry. Yeah. Big so um, yes, between the BCL and the MLF, uh, as I said, the, the BCL I think is is the course to do if w what you're principally interested in is litigation. Um, if what you're interested in is, uh, is transactional work or going to work for a regulator or going to work uh, in business ultimately, uh, then the MLF uh, is probably the uh, more appropriate course for you to do. Um, if you want to be an academic, then either of these courses will provide you with a good foundation. Um, the difference between the MLF and the MCL uh, in Cambridge is that the Cambridge MCL is essentially a specialist law degree. So it's a law degree that focuses on corporate law. It provides a wide range of corporate law options. Uh, our MLF program provides a wide range of law options, but it also provides an integrated grounding in finance. And so our degree is a joint degree with the business school, uh, and it provides students with the, the financial tools, uh, and it also provides students with the, uh, the core course that brings together specifically the finance and the law tools. Uh, and uh, if, if that's uh, something that appeals to you, then I think the, M the uh, MLF really is unique uh, in that respect. Um, and actually another uh, uh, similar uh, theme, someone who's possibly considering an MBA um, either uh, now or mm, right. uh, down the road, and how would the MLF have an impact right. on that, or right. would it impact it on right. a positive way? So my colleagues in the business school, uh, they tell me that the MLF students uh, do the useful bits of an MBA for much less money than the MBA costs. Uh, that's the way that they describe it. Uh, so they think that my colleagues in the finance sector think think that the finance components are the really important bits of an MBA. So the, uh, the finance that we do in this course is at the same level as MBA finance, uh, and so uh, students are able to get exposure to M uh, MBA level study uh, in finance by doing the MLF. I uh, can't find a network connection. Please connect and try again. Have we lost the connection? No, not no, apparently. Uh, so uh, the, uh, 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 the, what an MBA contains that the MLF doesn't uh, is a wide range of other uh, leadership, uh, strategy, uh, 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 and human resource management type uh, uh, skills and uh, courses which are uh, not uh, within the MB MLF diet. Uh, so it's perfectly feasible that somebody might do an MLF um, and then uh, take themselves uh, further down their career trajectory. Uh, they might end up working uh, in-house uh, in, in, uh, in a business and want to uh, subsequently do an, an MBA. Uh, and the uh, MLF, I think, would provide a, a stepping stone to that and would certainly make the finance uh, part of the year easier. We actually have one of our MLF alumni, I believe, coming back to do our MBA program next year, uh, so there's certainly a precedent for it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, a couple of um, final um, specific questions um, here. One particularly, how is the evaluation, uh, what's the evaluation criteria for, um, uh, and how does that work? And also, um, a question here about particular electives I'd, um, uh, which are available. We, these questions we can answer online, perhaps. Um, In fact, I think the information is, on the, yeah, it is, is on on, it is online. Yeah. Um, so I think um, what we might do is we're coming to the end of the session now, um, is um, uh, just checking and making sure there isn't anything I've missed on the questions. 
Um, if, if there is anything we've missed, we will um, answer that offline yeah, and simply make the answers available via WebLearn. I think we've probably covered covered most m most of your questions. I hope. Um, perhaps now we'll just wrap it up um, and uh, um, back to John. Yeah. So I, I just want, um, by way of um, closing the session, just to congratulate you all. Uh, on the immense achievement of being uh, offered a place to come and study for the MLF. Uh, so this year we had uh, an exceptionally strong uh, level of interest in the program. We've had one of the largest uh, fields of applications that we've ever had. Uh, and there are many, many people to whom we would have liked to have made an offer, but just simply didn't have the space available to do so. Uh, so those of you to whom we have made an offer, um, you are an exceptionally talented uh, group of people. and. Uh, Congratulations on uh, having an offer. We very much hope that you will accept it, and we look forward to welcoming you to Oxford uh, in the autumn. Uh, and you will be, I think, uh, similarly diverse uh, in terms of your backgrounds uh, to uh, what Corey and Kira were describing, uh, and um, I'm sure that you will find it a, a very fruitful and enjoyable year. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to uh, listen to our webinar today. And I'll just uh, pass over to everyone else who wants to say goodbye as well. Thank you very much, and I really hope to see uh, all of you uh, this coming fall. Yep, thank you for my part as well, and I, I, I've, be, I've enjoyed my year here, and I'm, I'm sure you will do that as well, so just accepting an offer is a wise choice. <laughs> thank you. I agree with what Kira said, and <laughs> hopefully in several years we'll all be getting together at alumni then. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you everyone for joining us, and I'm sure I'll be in touch with you in the near future. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>